Hi. Um, my name is Shana Skakoon Sparling. Like I said, I'm an assistant professor of psychology in the applied social psychology area at the University of Guelph. And I'm going to tell you about my work on social connection and loneliness among sexual minority men in Canada. Um, and I have notes on my computer over here, so I'm going to advance everything all at once, hopefully. There we go. All right, so let's start out talking about loneliness. Um, I've, you've probably heard a lot about loneliness already at this conference, <clears throat> so some of the things I'm going to say are probably <clears throat> things you've already heard. But um, <clears throat> as humans, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, my, my baby's in daycare and gave me an amazing head cold. <clears throat> okay, ready. All right. <clears throat> so as humans, we have this innate need to form and maintain uh, relationships that are positive, long-lasting, and significant in our lives. And when these needs for belongingness are only partially met or, or deprived, we experience this as a feeling of loneliness. Now, one of our other presenters in the last session, David, already mentioned this, but it's important to recognize that loneliness is socially produced. It comes from the subjective appraisal of social isolation, not social isolation itself. So this means that even people who seem to be socially well-connected, they can also still experience loneliness that negatively impacts their social, emotional, and behavioral outcomes. <coughs> So my work's really focused on sexual minority men and their experiences of loneliness because members of sexual minority groups, like sexual minority men, experience unique, ex uh, unique, unique negative experiences due to heterosexism. Maybe another slide, there we go, all right. So these experiences can lead to negative self-perceptions like internalized homonegativity and minority stressors like this, which are closely linked with having difficulty forming social connections, uh, perceiving fewer social supports, and experiencing low connectedness to peer groups in the community. So this means that sexual minority men may be particularly vulnerable to developing a sense of loneliness and isolation compared to their heterosexual peers. There we go, okay. So in much of my work, when it comes to looking at, at loneliness and social connection, I'm really concerned about how stigma and feelings of loneliness need, lead to downstream negative outcomes like sexual risk taking. Um, and so for this work, I, I use the loneliness and sexual risk model quite a bit because this model offers some explanation for how it is that people who are feeling very lonely can end up in engaging in behaviors that increase their risk for STIs. And According to the model, it's, it's because loneliness is accompanied by emotional distress. And this creates a discomfort that drives individuals to seek intimacy, sometimes at all costs, to manage this pain. So among sexual minority men, loneliness is associated not only with negative psychological states like depression and anxiety, but also with behaviors that increase risk for SEIs. These behaviors can include uh, substance use, compulsive partner seeking, hypersexuality, and engaging in condomless anal sex. And again, these behaviors are all aimed at managing the distress they're experiencing due to loneliness. There, okay. All right, I've got to point it back there. All right. But we know that social support can help. Supportive relationships are an important resource for coping. And here I'm talking about perceived social support, which is based on our subjective impressions of the, the amount and the quality of support that we believe we have available. Social support can have direct positive effects on health. We know that social support is associated with a lower risk for mortality, but it can also help buffer against chronic stressors because social support can help us form that sense of belonging and meaning in our lives, which facilitates coping. Uh, among sexual minorities, we know that social support has been found to buffer against neg the negative effects of homophobic stressors on emotional distress. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about some of my work on loneliness and social support, maybe. Okay, there we go. Uh, all right, so the first study I'm going to tell you about, I looked at, at sexual minority men and loneliness, um, and I drew on data from the Momentum Health Study, which is a large scale of sex, sexual minority men's health that collected data from men living in Vancouver. <clears throat> so for this study, I was interested in looking at the demographic factors and sexual behaviors that are associated with loneliness among sexual minority men in Canada. And I found, 
some stuff. So I found um, that lonelier sexual minority men did, did, did indeed tend to report more sex partners in the last six months and lower odds of using condoms during anal sex. So these findings do seem to demonstrate that association between loneliness and increased sexual risk taking in this population. But I also found, yeah, I also found that guys who were out, <coughs> guys who were out tended to report less loneliness. I also found that guys who reported more social support also reported less loneliness. So these results are supporting that inverse link between social support and loneliness in this population as well. So for my next study, I took a deeper look at, I took a deeper look at the role of social support in sexual health. Um, for this study, I used data from the Engage Cohort Study, which is a multi-site national study operating out of Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. And for this study, I looked at the main effects of social support on HIV risk and prevention behaviors, as well as the buffering effect of social support. So the ability of social support to mitigate that association between sexual orientation-based chronic stress and sexual risk taking. Ooh, there we go. Um, okay, so in this study, I found that higher perceived social support was associated with a variety of HIV prevention related behaviors and outcomes among sexual minority men. We saw greater odds of engaging in behavioral uh, HIV risk reduction strategies. We saw greater frequency of talking about HIV status with partners. And we saw lower odds of engaging in higher risk sex. So that's great. We also found that internalized homonegativity, higher levels, were associated with increased odds of engaging in higher risk sex in this sample. But among sexual minority men who had higher internalized homonegativity, if they also had high social support, this was associated with a large reduction in the odds of engaging in higher risk sex. So this is my blue dashed line. So you can see it's, it's a dramatic drop, a significant drop. So this demonstrates that important role for social support with resilience. Oh, there we go, here we, that's happening. All right, so the third study I'm gonna tell you about today, we looked at loneliness among sexual minority men in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now you probably remember that during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in Canada, social distancing and isolation measures were imposed, but these kinds of public health measures are associated with increases in loneliness and decreases in social support. So I wondered how would this kind of social isolation impact sexual minority men? Because according to the loneliness and sexual risk model, more loneliness should equal more sexual risk taking. But if we're not supposed to be getting together with people, it's pretty hard to engage in sexual risk taking through a computer screen. So um, we wanted to see what, what would happen. So for this study, um, <clears throat> we actually were able to set up a sub-study in, in the engaged cohort study that just focused on COVID-19. Um, and we did two points of data collection. We had our first module um, in what we could consider like the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the second module, which was administered six months later for each of the participants, uh, ended up being kind of in the second year of the COVID-19 pandemic. <coughs> All right, so during the early phases of the COVID-19 pandemic, so in that first module, we found that it was younger GBM who tended to report more loneliness and less emotional support. Ooh, there we go. <clears throat> One of the other things we wanted to take a look at is how did in-person social connection change in the, co in the pandemic? How did, and we looked at this using um, people's reported number of new sex partners. And to track these changes, because we had an ongoing cohort study, we were able to look at participants' data for six to 12 months before the onset of the pandemic, depending on when their study visit was. Um, their reported number of sex partners, new sex partners at module one, and their reported number at module two. So the data I'm gonna show you only used data from participants who had uh, reported numbers of sex partners for all three time points. And then sure enough, we see that participants reported significantly fewer sex partners at our COVID-1 module relative to our pre-COVID module. Although there was a slight increase between COVID-1 and COVID-2, it, it, that wasn't significant. It's not a significant difference. So this is telling us that sexual minority men did seem to temporarily adapt their sexual activity in line with public health guidelines for COVID-19, despite reporting increased feelings of loneliness. 
and then are gradually began engaging in more sexual encounters as public health guidelines loosened and vaccines became more available. Uh, in fact, yeah. <clears throat> in fact, when we take a look at the data from COVID module two, who's more likely to report engaging in sexual risk taking? We see it's younger sexual minority men. We see it's men who reported living alone and also men who reported experiencing more loneliness at our first time point. Um, for our COVID modules. So this is in line with that longitudinal analysis showing the changes in the number of new sex partners that I showed you on the previous slide. So as COVID restrictions are easing, as fears about COVID are decreasing, the behavior of the lonelier men uh, in our study is supporting that loneliness and sexual risk model where increased loneliness is in associated or leads to increased sexual risk taking. So in summary, across those three studies that I told you about today, we saw that social support seems to be an important resource among sexual minority men. We saw that direct association with increased protective sexual health behaviors. And we saw that buffering effect against internalized homonegativity, so against this experience of internalized stigma. And we also saw a little bit about loneliness. We saw that it does seem to be associated with increased sexual risk taking. And in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, this seemed to be particularly true for younger sexual minority men. So in conclusion, this tells us, this, this work all tells us that helping sexual minority men to develop supportive connections is gonna help provide valuable and tangible benefits for improving their health and well-being overall. Because having this kind of supportive network in place, it can offer some protection for these men and improve their coping during periods of increased isolation or exposure to increased exposure to stigma um, and other chronic stressors. <clears throat> there we go. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to take a, a quick moment to acknowledge my, uh, <clears throat> my uh, <laughs> institutional community and funding partners, um, as well as our study staff across those two studies, like three studies I talked about, um, our participants, our volunteers. I wouldn't be able to collect this data without these amazing people. If you want to learn more about the Engage study, I present a couple of, uh, of studies using data from this study. We've got a website, but otherwise, um, thank you for your time and attention. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so my name is Victoria and today I'm gonna to be discussing the topic of planning for immigration and the importance of prioritizing human connection within municipal policy. Um, and this presentation is drawing on some of my research that's supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Okay, so to give some background to who I am, um, I did my Bachelor of Arts at the University of Toronto in Sociology and Urban Studies, where I became really passionate about human geography and how populations change over time, um, and what immigrant settlement can look like in different geographic contexts. Um, so currently I'm pursuing my Master's in Urban and Regional Planning at Queen's University, um, and I'm also a researcher within the Population in Place Research Lab, which is headed by Dr. Maxwell Hart. Um, so when I began learning about the field of urban planning, I was really fascinated by how much planning overlaps with so many different aspects of our existence, um, from where we live to how we get around to our daily social interactions. Um, and the way our communities and our neighborhoods are structured heavily influences the choices that we make on a daily basis um, and our ability to interact with one another. And it's no secret that people like living near other people. Um, by 2050, it's projected that more than two thirds of the population, the world population will be living in urban areas. Um, we crave that connection, and even in a country as large as Canada, there's still this pull towards our three largest urban centers. Yet federal, Canada's federal immigration policy is continuing to more, move towards an increasingly regionalized approach, um, distributing higher proportions of immigrants and refugees into mid- and small-sized municipalities. And for municipalities in Atlantic Canada, the prospects of immigrant redistribution to combat declining industries, shrinking and aging populations, as well as smaller tax bases are proving to be quite attractive. Um, so when I began to dive into some of the literature on immigrant settlement, I began to wonder what does settlement look like in these non-traditional locations? Um, what are the challenges and opportunities that accompany planning for settlement in a city like Moncton, New Brunswick, as opposed to somewhere like Toronto? Um, and how can mid and small sized cities improve their planning and settlement policies to become more attractive settlement locations? And so I began my case study in Moncton, New Brunswick. 
As a small city on the East Coast with a population of under 90,000, it's not somewhere that you would expect people to want to settle at first glance. Um, <laughs> yet the city has been doing a great deal of work to leverage their municipal resources to support and sustain new population growth and better support settlement within the, with the development of the Greater Moncton Immigration Strategy. Um, so over the past decade, the situation in Moncton has really started to change. Um, since industries began to decline in the 80s, the city experienced growth in its knowledge and service sectors and recognized a need for more laborers. In 2006, a new immigration strategy emerged, and as this evolved, the Greater Moncton Local Immigration Partnership was able to form in 2013. At the peak of the Syrian refugee crisis, Moncton was then able to take in one-third of New Brunswick's total at refugees who settled there. And since then, the city is continuing to look for new ways to improve their approach. So in January 2022, the Government of Canada announced that they would be investing over $35 million to help expand the country's capacity for resettlement um, in smaller and more rural municipalities, including the addition of nine new resettlement assistance programs. So with the recent influxes of immigrant and refugee populations, this is a critical time to explore the impacts that planning policies and associated planning decisions have had on immigrant settlement and retention in order to provide some insight for upcoming policy reviews. So my research focuses on analyzing how we can improve long-range planning policy in small-sized cities to better accommodate immigrant settlement. And to do this, I'm conducting a three-part case study which involves a content analysis and semi-structured interviews with planners and settlement workers in Moncton to get a better sense of the impact of current planning policy and how they can be improved over time. So the first part of my case study, there we go. <laughs> first part of my case study involved a content analysis of Moncton's municipal plan, strategic plan, and greater Moncton immigration strategy. Um, I investigated key themes within these documents to get a better sense of Moncton's current approach. Um, and these involve the mention of immigration, so how often they were discussing newcomers, immigrants, refugees, um, how accessible resources are, so things like affordable housing, um, good transportation networks, stuff like that. Um, how the capacity for immigrants and migrants to get involved in decision making when it comes to planning decisions, um, the approach to community building, equity considerations, meeting basic needs, and obviously of more, most interest to this group, social connection. So, in forming the Greater Moncton Immigration Strategy, the city consulted with over 60 organizations and collected input from over 600 people. They identified strengths and challenges associated with their current approach to immigration, and two categories were analyzed, were social engagement and neighborhood engagement. The city found that organizations within Greater Moncton were willing to step up and support newcomers to the area and played a big role in getting people comfortable within their new home. So this is stuff like churches, sports organizations, um, civic groups, stuff like that. Um, but a big challenge that they face is while these organizations are critical to immigrant retention, they don't necessarily have the support system or funding in place to continue to operate at the capacity that's required. Um, in terms of neighborhood engagement, the city developed Moncton's Good Neighbor Guide, which helps educate residents on city bylaws, but also how to be a good neighbor to one another by doing things like being willing to help out and alerting one another if you have an event going on. It's a very wholesome document if you have time to look at it. Um, but the city has recognized the need for more deliberate efforts to help connect longtime residents with new neighbors and newcomers to the neighborhood. Um, and considering their municipal plan, um, we see a great focus on open spaces and a priority to not underestimate the public realm's potential to bring people together. The plan emphasizes a priority to promote social interaction and community building by focusing on civic design and high quality public realm. And these policies align with what guiding documents are saying. The United Nations Urban Development Migration Toolkit, which was kind of my guide for creating these criteria, um, demonstrated that key development plans should reflect the importance of social cohesion as, as it is critical for immigrants to have opportunities for connection. We need to, more accessible public spaces and mixed neighborhoods to allow the opportunity for increased social interaction between people. We need to improve our zoning regulations to ensure that places of connection such as community centers and places of worship are proximal to residential areas and easy for people to access. We also need to ensure that migrant groups have the opportunity to be involved in these decisions through meaningful public consultation. And as I move forward my, with my field work, I'm going to eventually be going to Moncton and doing some more interviews, as I mentioned. Um, I'll be digging deeper into the impacts that policies such as these have had on the ground floor. And I hope you'll join me in working towards a more connected neighborhoods for everyone.
So thank you so much. And you can visit our website if you want to learn more about the work being done in our lab. Thank you very much, Victoria. Han Shu, come on up. And then I'd like all presenters just to be ready to come up for the panel at the end. Awesome. Thank you very much. You're making it easier, are you, Mujidat? <laughs> Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Hanshu. And my name is Majida Lekuti. And we are, the we are Bachelors of Health Sciences students from Queens, and we are research assistants with the School of Nursing. Um, we're representing the Canadian Association of Nursing Stimulation, CANSCIM, under a project led by Dr. Marion Lufford Cloyd called the Addressing Racism and Microaggressions in the Classroom and Clinical Settings Virtual Stimulation Experience. So just to start off with an icebreaker, I wanted to be an astronaut growing up, but my astronaut dream slowly faded away with supposedly well-intended comments from my parents and my teachers saying that I didn't really have a chance to be selected astronaut as an astronaut just because of my race and gender. It seems that within the black, indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC communities, there are numerous stories about individuals being discouraged from pursuing their dreams, often regarded by some as unattainable. So BIPOC communities are frequently underrepresented in university leadership roles, the faculty, administration, and governing bodies. Um, this uh, underrepresentation may affect how decisions are made and thereby kind of contribute to the institutionalized inequities. Well, some may argue that resources and opportunities are distributed solely based on talent and effort and not race, systemic barriers persist for learners of color. We cannot overlook the experiences of students who have been discouraged from pursuing their dreams due to racially biased comments and actions made by their teachers. Nor can we dismiss the discomfort felt by students as a result of racialized actions or comments from their classmates. So it is important to acknowledge that addressing racism can be an uncomfortable process for everyone, but we have a duty to support one another. Our stimulation hopes to open up the dialogue. It's, it was created based on lived and observed experiences of diverse groups of undergraduate students and faculty of health sciences educators. So just so that everyone is on the same page, we will just be going over some background and key terminology that we will be using throughout our simulation and our presentation. So North American higher education culture and systems often perpetuate white-centric perspectives, and this impacts the well-being of BIPOC learners who attend these institutions. And we define BIPOC as those identifying as black, indigenous, or people of color. Persons in this position experience exhaustion from the psychological, physiological, and behavioral stress of racism, known as racial battle fatigue. This experience leads to negative effects like loneliness, the impact of loneliness and other factors, such as constantly elevated blood pressure and decreased academic performances, sets up these learners to fail. The experiences we, des we described earlier impacts these groups every day. They're coined as microaggressions, which is a brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indig indigeny, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile or negative prejudicial, prejudicial sorry, insults towards groups. So our simulation serves as an intervention in the stereotype to prejudice to discrimination pipeline. Essentially, labels are placed on certain groups and they persist in our unconscious and that can in turn influence how we treat and view them. And over time, this develops into systemic discrimination and the desire for social distance from certain groups. As a result, we propose virtual simulation to be used as an educational approach, and this will help learners recognize racism within academic settings and foster allyship with equity-seeking groups when in a bystander situation. 
They will also acquire transferable skills and become more aware of these racially motivated aggressions in their daily life. We have a pre-learning stimulation consisting of five short scenes depicting racially discriminatory acts. A longer simulation involves documented lived and observed cases of racism in educational settings with a bystander present. As a bystander, the viewer will have will have the decision to make their next steps. So at Queens, this is developed within the Faculty of Health Sciences in the School of Nursing. So by training the next generation of health professionals, we ensure cultural sensitivity and awareness throughout clinically, and this can decrease cultural mistrust and really increase the well-being and social connectedness of marginalized groups. We have integrated feedback received from EDII experts and usability testing. And we have also developed this in accordance with the Queen's Faculty of Health Sciences EDIIA pillars and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute's objectives. So this simulation follows the ARISE model and throughout a number of scenes it allows participants to take on the role of a bystander and this encompasses five key elements. One, being awareness. Two, being responding with empathy. Three, inquiring about the facts. Four, using I statements. And five, being educating and engaging. And overall, this, this um, really allows learners to identify racism in everyday settings, recognize the impact, and develop better allyship. While collaborating with EDIIA experts within our faculty, we discussed the impact we hope this experience would achieve. Our stimulation is proposed as a tool to increase equity-deserving learners' retention and improve learner education relationships. Hence, we strongly propose the reconsideration and discontinuation of the term microaggressions. So you may have noticed our air quotes or slight sarcasm every time we say the term microaggressions because we believe the term micro and microaggressions indicate that these everyday aggressive acts experienced by equity seeking persons have a small impact on their standardized living conditions but microaggressions they are becoming standardized in our um, society and studies have shown that microaggressions can have a large impact on an individual and community it inadequately captures the magnitude of an aggressor's action, which is rooted in structural racism and or racist ideologies. We should prioritize acknowledging the harmful effects of an action rather than minimizing the action and centering the term on the intentions of the aggressor. Hence, while intentional or not, microaggressions must be acknowledged as racism. So we suggest using the term covert racism instead of microaggressions for subtle acts of racism. Covert racism can be defined as racial discrimination that is concealed or subtle and it acts to uh, subvert, distort, restrict, or deny um, kind of the same rights and privileges to racial minorities. And perpetrators can claim possible deniability when they are committing these covert acts and deny that the act was actually racist, which undermines the harmful effects. This differentiates from overt racism, also known as explicit racism, intentional or obvious discriminatory attitudes or behaviors of a person towards another. So we adapted this image of the iceberg model from the center of the study of social policy from a paper published in 2019 and it's kind of like the typical iceberg we picture from like Titanic for example where the tiny tip of the iceberg is just things that are like not socially acceptable to be said towards another person or expressed but everything below the iceberg it's kind of just a part of life and this really contributes to racial battle fatigue and loneliness. So we'd like to challenge you to engage with the scene from our simulation. We will play a scene from our main simulation where you can then vote on if the interaction is covert or overt racism or neither. So we don't have time to discuss, but there is a menti poll after this scene that we will play. And if we would like to have a discussion, it can be during the panel or sometime after this presentation. Can someone press play? Hi, thank you for meeting with me, Rachel. I just have a few questions about the last week's lecture. Hi, Dia. I'm a little surprised. When I first met you, I didn't think you would be able to speak English so well. Is it your um, first language? Uh, yeah, it is. So believe it or not, these are documented live experiences from learners in very recent years at a Canadian institution. 
So just advancing to the next slide, feel free to go on um, menti.com and enter the code or just scan the QR code on your smartphones. Um, if you prefer to... You can just shout it out and we can just have a conversation here. Yeah. Um, if you like, mm -hmm. you can tell us what you think, whether it's covert or over racism or neither. I'm thinking. Over. So this happened we, at our last conference. We had like discussions around how it could be covert or it could be over. And the main part, the main point of the simulation is there is no correct answer, but it's to generate discussions about the underlining um, effects of covert and over racism. Because we could argue either way, but it's just really having that discussion that is, is that's our, like our main point of this entire simulation discussions. For instance, it can't be seen as a comp compliment from the instructor, but it can't be seen as really, I guess, discriminatory. Yeah, and like um, assuming that English is a uh, more superior language and that can be really harmful to the students and their minority groups. So just to quickly wrap up our conversation. We believe in the significance of diversity as it's important to recognize the immense value derived from people's diverse experience. Therefore, we must encourage proportional representation in educational institutions. From our healthcare background, diversity plays a pivotal role in ensuring equitable and cultural competent care, as well as fueling innovations and future research. In addition, more diversity in the healthcare field addresses health disparities by fostering trust and enhancing communications between doctors and their patients. So to maximize um, knowledge retention, especially among students, we took our generation's short attention span in mind to make the in simulation engaging, yet relatable and informative. And this simulation is open access and it's now available on the CanSIMS website. So we do have these cards. You can, you're free to like take a few and we ho look forward to seeing um, our simulation available for use in your classrooms and programs. Our next step of research is really um, integrating it into classrooms and determining its efficacy and impact on um, students within the Faculty of Health Sciences. So that wraps up our presentation. Thank you for listening. you're up next and that'll be our last presenter and then we'll have the panel thank you so much really great work you guys um hello um my name is Mabe and I am one of the co-founders of the rural Ontario community of queer youth we uh were co-founded in um, June of 2021, I participated in a research participation project through CAMH that was um, researching about queer youth's experiences who have accessed mental health care during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we discussed different barriers that we had faced and one of the uh, barriers that different youth had faced was rural access, rural access to queer and trans resources, rural access to mental health care resources, and rural access to affirming um, and mental health resources that could understand and support queer and trans youth. Um, so after that, we decided that we wanted to like create our idea into a reality. Um, so we hosted like a series of um, care and wellness workshops on different themes. Uh, created an art scene and I went to different rural prides across the province um, and I've just been doing work for rural queer communities since then as well in other ways um, and one important point that I wanted to touch on is the importance of intersectionality when we think about marginalized identities um, as we can think that all like identities that are marginalized experience isolation, but once you add in other layers of intersections, it can become more and more isolating for the people. Um, so like not just um, we, through research, people know that like queer and trans folks experience isolation, especially youth. And we also know that people in rural communities experience social isolation, especially the more remote those communities become. But there is like a great lack of research on uh, isolation for this specific population of rural queer folks. Um, and then once you add in like other layers to identities such as like disability, class, and race, 
uh, people can be become more and more isolated within society. Um, and so I just wanted to share a poem with you that I had written. Um, and it's called A Wildflower Dreams of Queer Futures. And it talks a lot about suicide rates um, for queer and trans populations, as well as part of my own lived experience. The child in me was a dandelion, bright yellow, fitting in to neither pink nor blue norms of the gender binary. The thing about weeds is they're only weeds if they are considered to be growing unwanted. The queer child in me with grass stains and skin knees was made to believe that they too were growing unwanted. Cut down and picked on to make smaller, excluded from bouquets of flowers. I never did fit in with the girls, nor did I fit in with the boys either. A drifter, shapeshifter, wandering and wondering what garden I'd be able to call my home. A daydreamer, wanting and pondering about the future I would one day know. It is a fact that more than half of transgender and non-binary youth seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year. Remembering everyone that has said anything queerphobic to me and holding inside my bones constricting. Believing that one day it gets better when I'm older and can move to the city to finally be queer because queer folks don't belong in the country. That's just not something folks could be here. Queer suicides normalized. I was traumatized. We need to realize what can support trans lives and stop the lies they're fed to believe. It is a fact. The trans youth who are allowed to use their chosen name experience a 65% decrease in suicide attempts. It is a fact. The trans youth who have their pronouns respected by all or most people in their lives attempted suicide at half the rates of those who did not. Call me a flower, don't call me a weed. Use they, them pronouns to refer to me, not inanimate pronouns as I am living. It took years. Years of slowly coming out. Years of slowly coming into myself. By the end of my high school years, I had built up enough confidence to love myself, but I still struggled to love my queer self. I wanted to be the perfect ally while still wishing I wasn't queer myself. The first pride I ever attended was Toronto World Pride 2014, when I was 18 years old. That day was a day I'll never forget. I hung out with a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend and chatted on their apartment lawn as we all drank and smoked weed. The deep connection I felt with these genderqueer beauties who were proud to be transformed me. This was my first time meeting people who I could envision myself to be. It is a fact that having at least one accepting adult can reduce the risk of a suicide attempt amongst LGBTQ youth by 40%. I found ways to grow through the cracks of payment, found ways to grow in a garden amongst flowers planted, found ways to grow even when I was made to feel unwanted. To make sure my presence was bold and known that I'll continue to exist in this genderqueer body of mine, coloring outside the lines of what is acceptable. The world of rainbows shine through my sweat and tears. The lion in me roared as I continued to survive, found ways to thrive. I stayed alive. I was 22 when I finally cut my hair short again, came out as genderqueer on my Instagram, living halfway around the world in a supportive community. I was terrified but felt like I was finally setting myself free. From over a decade of shame I had held inside my body, me. Living proudly as non-binary is me giving a hug to my childless self, holding them in my arms tight and letting them know everything is going to turn out all right. Not in a it gets better way, but in a you are fucking resilient and fierce and beautiful for existing way. It is a fact. The 67% of transitioning people thought about suicide pre-transition, only 3% post-medical transition. I'm standing here center stage more than my wildest dreams believed I could ever achieve. I'm alive. I'm present. I'm here. And sure as fuck, I'm queer. I'm queer in the country where my rural roots ground me, creating communities so all rural queer youth can feel a sense of belonging without feeling as though they must leave and head to the city. You can take the queer kid out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the queer kid. You can't take the country out of me. And now my wildest dream so that every queer youth can have stories of happy queers so they can believe their life is beautiful because of their queerness, not despite their queerness. It's a fact. The transgender youth who have fully socially transi transitioned to their gender and have been supported in doing so do not have elevated depressive symptoms compared to everyone else. Let the lion in me roar as I transition into a white flower full of seeds. Let the wind pick me up and carry me. Let me fly in the sky and land wherever the wind takes me. You may bury me, but I will grow again. Bring new life, let my wishes fly high. Let there be a garden of wildflowers who were once made to believe that they were weeds. Let them grow and make their home together. Let them be each other's family. Let them nourish the butterflies who have transformed through metamorphosis. Let them nourish the bees making sweet honey. Let them enrich the soil through their gifts uniquely. Let none of their petals be love me nods. Let them thrive. In all the ways I dream of a future where trans lives are celebrated and embraced. 
where trans youth feel at home in their bodies and I in my childhood's wildest dreams, that I could survive in all glory, genderqueer beyond belief, and I pray to thank God for the gifts they have given me, queerness being the most beautiful gift of them all. Thank you. Thank you. Whew. That was powerful. Wow, May, please have a seat. And the rest of our presenters, please do come up. And we have time for a few questions. I think John will be happy we're getting on track. Thank you very much. Wow, well, I really am just knocked out by all of these amazing uh, presentations and the emphasis on differences and how those differences contribute to loneliness. So any initial thoughts from any of the panelists? I see there's one microphone. Maybe we can grab a couple more here. Um, but when I mentioned differences and the ability to kind of change community, who wants to grab that? How do you see um, what we've heard today related to, you know, connecting and, and understanding the impact of loneliness? It feels like we've got some policy issues that we could be um, moving forward. And so within the school realm and in communities, specific communities, either immigrant or um, queer communities, any um, advice to policymakers or the researchers in the community here? It seems like you've all expressed that um, difficulty of the differences. And I've always valued differences, but you can't just take my word for it. I have to prove it to you, right? And how are we proving it to our communities? Take it on. Okay, so it's on. Um, in my opinion, I feel like curriculum is the main factor in all the differences we're seeing in the world today. So just to give a personal anecdote, this summer I was working in a position where I was really relaying like kind of like how diseases manifest in our body and portraying it to like um, people in elementary school. And these students, they don't really see differences. Curriculum is now adjusted so that they just see people as people and they don't see like skin color or sexuality, but they just see it as people. And they don't see, like, they, they are more inclined to help um, their classmates with disabilities just because we're not es explicitly pointing these differences out. And yeah, I just feel like modified curriculum is a good step forward. And I would say in educational institutions, I think while like we're building the curriculum and we're making it more inclusive, it's like we also need to get diversity in these institutions. If we're fixing the curriculum in a sense and that we're not getting diversity, I don't think it's as effective. I think it's really important to have safe spaces. Um, I think it's really important to go into communities and, t and help them come to university, give them mentoring programs. Um, there's just so much that can be, I feel like there's so much that should be done in different communities rather than just like making, um, making a policy and just putting it out there. You need to make sure that people know about these policies. So I just think it's really important to have safe spaces and just getting diversity into these educational institutions. That's the only way we're gonna have diversity in the future. And like a diversity in healthcare, or diversity in any field. Um, I, I would also say that it's really, uh, like one of the things that struck me about about your presentation and one of the things I tried to incorporate in mine, um, it, it's this, this, these sources of stigma and the stigma that is leading to social exclusion, that is leading to s experiencing social isolation, that is leading to loneliness. And so finding more ways to reduce stigma. Um, we know that uh, gay straight alliances in schools are a good way to start um, reducing some of this stigma. And, uh, and so more, more policy that's around that, more support for these kinds of initiatives. Um, I think I'd say for myself in planning, um, I think there's often, there is an emphasis on consultation, but I think we need to move towards more meaningful consultation. Um, I think sometimes when you're dealing with these like abstract issues, sometimes it can just become all about like numbers and we need X amount of houses here, we need this here, and you kind of lose that like people focus at the center of it. Um, and I think just finding ways to kind of improve that and really understanding how um, different development decisions are really affecting communities is really critical. Um, 
And yeah, just finding ways to kind of bring that those perspectives in and really incorporating people's feedback is something that I think we need to do better and do better at in a lot of municipalities. Any comment, maybe? Something that I think is important is just like listening to people and hearing their stories. I think there's often this narrative of people like that are marginalized being voiceless, but rather um, it's the deliberately silenced and the preferably unheard. So I think just having real conversations to invite people to th your table and paying them for their time and hearing from them what ideas they have, I think is very important. Really great. Thank you very much for those comments. Just curious if there's any questions in the room. Um, absolutely want to hear from you. But I also just want to reflect on the idea about intersectionality that you mentioned. And I, it feels like loneliness is at like really exponentially a greater risk for people with differences. Um, when you look at the iceberg, there is a, an iceberg for every one of the communities here, right? There's socially acceptable and, and socially unacceptable ways of, of navigating some of the relationships. Um, but definitely being a friend and being available um, is what we're looking at um, in the movement of GenWell. And um, is there opportunity to create new communities within the community that create those connections that if, there, if the safe space is needed? Um, I'm wondering about that, um, you know, like a nested community where people do find themselves. Sometimes in universities, there's either, you know, an international student club or something like that. But I'm just curious, or the GSAs that we talked about, is there, um, uh, is there a role for that? Or does it just emphasize the, the small community that you have and not really get to that sense of belonging in, in the larger community? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I think for my work, like when you're looking at like settlement and more like smaller cities and stuff, those strong community networks are really what's critical to kind of making that a good adjustment. Um, and I think some of the things that I've been looking at too with my like I organizations that I'm looking to interview and stuff are really grassroots organizations that are kind of trying to bridge those gaps and um, doing even just uh, social events like barbecues and stuff like that to kind of give those opportunities for people to meet other people um, and bridge those connections that might not be as easy in a smaller municipality. I, I think that finding and building community is really challenging. Like in, in my work, I presented sexual minority men as, as a group and that's not a homogenous group. This includes men who identify as gay, men who identify as bisexual, men who identify as queer, men who identify as straight but also have sex with men. And these groups don't have equal access to a sense of community. Um, one, of the, one of the papers, one of my favorite papers that I put out a couple of years ago, last year, um, also kind of talked about, ad addressed this, that bisexual identifying men don't have the same sources of community that gay identifying men do. And, uh, and so this is a real challenge. Um, and I'm hoping I'm going to be able to look at it. I'm collecting some data right now looking at like loneliness and different sources of social connection and community connection in sexual minority men. So I'm hoping next year I'll be able to present some data on where are men finding their sources of community? Is online helpful? I know one of the things I, I was struck with your presentation about um, being a rural queer and how there's you were looking forward to moving to the city and going to Pride so that you could have opportunities to connect. So, what are we what are we doing? How are we building community? And I, I think that's something that still needs more exploration in the populations that I work with. I think what's really short that I wanted to add on was I feel like conferences like this and like an organization like this is really important because we're getting perspectives on different things. For instance, urban planning, like my best friend, um, they're in urban planning architecture and I didn't know that there was like social connection within like urban planning. I didn't know the importance of it. So I think having like conversations like this and conferences like this are really important and like just like the diversity of the people here sitting here with our different research, research backgrounds and like just all your different backgrounds is just really important in building community because we're understanding new perspectives. Awesome. I have a question back here. Okay. 
Um, one thing like I wanted to add is that I definitely think like grassroots organizing is very important to build community, but one thing it often lacks, especially within more marginalized communities, is funding um, to be able to build community together. And um, like I've been lucky through my organization, more my grassroots organizing to get different like community grants like through 880 Cities Ontario Changemakers Program and through the Canada Service Corps programs. But like besides that, for grassroots organizations, there's not a whole lot just because they want everybody to be a nonprofit in order to get any grant funding um, for different reasons. But I just wanted to highlight that as well. So just adding on to everyone's great points, I feel like student clubs, especially at um, high schools and higher education institutions, they are really beneficial because a lot of the stereotypes and discrimination we see today, they stem off misinformation. And just by these clubs kind of like spreading awareness for a certain cause or a certain group, it really allows people to learn more in a non-judgmental manner with like social media posts, for example. People are just learning as they scroll through like their stories, for example. And this really allows um, the breaking of like misinformation based stereotypes and for everyone to really see everyone as who they are. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone for your presentations. Um, I have a really specific question about the um, simulations. Um, so I've spent a bit of time in academia and I think in academia it's incredibly siloed a lot of the time. And I just I obviously appreciate you're in the health sciences um, faculty, but I, I just wonder if you have plans to expand your simulation out to be accessible to students across a variety of disciplines because I can see this uh, of course being important for a healthcare professional or students wanting to go into healthcare profession but i see the applicability in all students kind of being able to access and, and sort of take part in this so just wanted to ask about that yeah so thank you for your question so our simulation is just under like a nursing simulation organization so the main goal of it is really towards like health professional education just because of the connections that um, our PI has with the group. However, this particular um, simulation that we presented is meant to be general. It's set in like a typical classroom setting, so it's really applicable in various groups, programs, and classrooms. Yes, and we're handing out like little flyers, and you can we have an open access on the CanSkim um, website. So if you wanted to use it in your classes or just try it out or send it out, you can with the little flyers in the front. We are doing efficacy testing, so if you have feedback, please communicate it to us. It'd be really helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say um, the, the comment maybe you made about the importance of storytelling, and you guys were talking about classrooms and, and sharing the message. One of the things since you know seven years of, of, of launching the GenWell project, the message is not, we can't just tell the people that are struggling to say, you need to be more social. And I think part of it is to everybody in this room, and this we're preaching to the converted here. This, this room gets it, and this room is ready to embrace and share the messages. And I think your work, and we're going to share all of it on GenWell, the big job we have, I believe, is actually educating the rest of the population that marginalized people don't marginalize themselves. Mm -hmm. And that it's actually, if we can all appreciate what it might be like to go through a particular scenario or situation, and the, the difference that I can make by how I respond, by how I react, by how I accept, by how I include, is the message that I think we all need to walk out of this room with today to say we're part of the solution. It's not looking at you and saying, hey, well, you just need to be more social or you need to build more bridges. And I think that's the power of building a movement that incorporates every Canadian versus just saying to the people that are marginalized, it's your problem, you gotta figure it out. So I just wanna say thank you because all of the work you're doing is so incredibly important to awakening all Canadians to the challenges that we face, so. Really great comment. Yeah. So um, I think we're almost at the end of the panel here, but if there was any last comments by any of the presenters, I would welcome them. And I just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for just coming and sharing your research and your experiences. So thank you. That's it. Yeah.